It's not unorthodox to do that. We're not going to get in trouble. Um, this is a good, good time in the life of Christ Church. We are studying together scripture and a book that is the art of neighboring. And in that, what we are attempting to do is to hear from God through sacred text on how God is calling us to live in community with one another. More importantly, how God is calling us to do that beyond this physical structure that we call the church building, the sanctuary. And so on last week, um, I have reflected on the sermons uh, quite a bit. Um, they were incredibly intriguing, and I don't know if you were here or not, but um, the sermon title was Grasshoppers Are Giants, and in Dr. Temple's offering, we were invited to look at and explore how we understood the task before us if we saw it through the lenses of a grasshopper or a giant. And so in my paraphrasing it, I thought, what would life look like if we understood that the giant of our faith is Jesus Christ and culture, the obstacles that we have to overcome are the grasshoppers. And so over the course of the week, I've really been thinking about what it means to live the most faithful life, understanding that there is nothing in culture, there's not a grasshopper that we're going to encounter that the giant of our faith, Jesus Christ, is not with us. And then Pastor Michael Wayne came in and closed it out at the 1055 service, and he left us no choice. Um, he invited us to think about that same text through the lenses of God's invitation to us. And we don't really have a lot of choices if we want to be found faithful, you all. And that is, we should trust God. Can we trust God? Yes, we can. And so when we think about what it means to be faithful, to build community, when things seem overwhelming, larger than who we believe Christ to be, we are called to remember that there will never be a time or place or space that God is not with us and God is not equipping us to be in relationship with one another. And I pray that on last week you all heard that, that you all have had an opportunity to reflect on that, and that we will move forward toward today's scripture in yet another encounter of what it means to be in community, to be subjected to that which seems insurmountable, but rem remembering who Christ is. Our text for today comes from the Gospel of John, John the sixth chapter, one of the most talked about passages. And in fact, this particular story, this narrative has been shared in all four of the Gospels. So it must be important that it was recorded in such a way. So listen, if you would, to hear what God might have for you in the hearing of his word. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great cloud of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, 
for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy bread for everyone to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. This is God's word for God's people. Let us pray. God, we are most grateful that you continue to provide. We pray that in our time together that we would draw closer to you and hear that which you would have for us to understand. And in our understanding, may we be convicted to live ever more faithful. Thank you, God. In Christ Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. The question before Peter was, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, I don't know about you, but if I were among 5,000 people and chapel asked me, Michelle, I have about 5,000 people that I need to feed. And there are no stores open right now. That's exactly what I would do. I would freeze. How do you expect me to do that which is impossible? I love this text because Jesus was not asking Philip to do that which Jesus understood only he could do. Jesus was merely asking, are you willing? Oftentimes in our daily walk, we are overwhelmed by the needs of the society for which we encounter every day because the needs are everywhere. And if we cannot fix it, oftentimes we become immobilized, paralyzed. I'm reminded of a saying that my grandmother taught me when she used to see me scurrying around, oftentimes disappointed and discouraged because my plans were falling apart. I was failing to accomplish that which I believed I was supposed to do and be. And I remember her saying to me, Michelle, you've got to learn to crawl before you walk. You've got to learn to crawl before you walk. And what I am clear on is when I first heard her say that, I thought to myself, that's really nice, grandmother. 
However, that does not help me accomplish that which I so desperately feel I want to do, I need to do. But what I am clear on today, and that is what she was inviting me to do is that which Jesus was inviting Philip to do, that which scripture is encouraging us to be about today. And that is to stop and to turn our focus toward God, to hear from God what God would want us to understand, what it is that God would want us to do, and how it is that God would want us to do it. I value, I value the teachings of my grandmother. I regret not yielding to them earlier in life. Every day I wake up and I wonder, how are you going to take care of the needs of the people today? And then I stop and I remember, that is not why God woke me up today. He did not wake us up today to fix the problems of the world. He merely is inviting us to have an encounter with him, to position ourselves to hear from him so that when we encounter those who are in need, we will respond in a way that would allow them to experience the love and the light of Jesus Christ. I'd like to say that I've perfected this notion of being present with God, not having a need to fix things. But I'm not there yet. And I know that I'm not alone. And in fact, I was reminded just a few weeks ago as I traveled to Chicago for a trip and I um, got off the plane and I had a choice as to whether I wanted to take uh, a taxi or an Uber or take the train. And I decided to take the train. And in doing so, I passed through places that reminded me of the pain that I experience daily. And that is poverty, disparity. I saw projects and I saw buildings closed down and I became overwhelmed, but in that moment, God gave me a sweet gift. He said, Michelle, remember, I'm not calling you to fix it. I'm merely calling you to be faithful. Church, God is merely calling us to be faithful. Faithful participants in responding to the needs of those around us. And the needs are great. I love this passage because there are no surprises that Jesus is experiencing. Jesus travels to a very uh, solitude, place of solitude. In some of the translations, it talks about it as a desert, a place of isolation. Jesus got these people off by themselves. Jesus understood that the needs that were before the people were far greater than any one human being could ever address. They were on their way to the Passover festival. They were on their way to keep ritual. They were on their way 
to celebrate this holy time in the life of their religious community. And Jesus stopped them. And he positioned them. And he sat among them to demonstrate to them, even in a time of disparity and in a time of desolation and in a time of isolation, I alone am the only answer. And so today, church, we are called to be neighbors. We are called to love well. We are called to keep the great commandment. And that is to love the Lord our God with all of who we are, with all of our heart. And if it breaks, it breaks. That's okay. With all of our soul, if we cry, we cry. With all of our being, if we get tired and we get weary, we just get tired and we get weary. But God is inviting us to love him with our very being. And it's not until we really get it are we going to be able to be the neighbors that God is calling us to be. It is time for us to stop acting as though the world is not falling apart. Every day I have conversations, as I'm sure many of you all do, about the fiber and the integrity of our culture, how it is deteriorating, how we can just ignore the marginalized, the disenfranchised, those who are hurting, those who are in need. We can't do that, church. We cannot do that. And that is one of the reasons why Christ gathered the people in the place which he gathered them. He wanted them to understand, but more importantly, he wanted the disciples to understand and he wants us to understand today. We've got to be willing to get in the trenches, the places of isolation, the places of darkness, the places of despair, the places where we cannot fix it, but we go into recognizing that he will meet us where we are. God is simply asking, are you willing? Will you be found faithful? My grandmother was on to something when she said, baby, you need to crawl before you walk. That is to say, you need to build a foundation. You need to get your priorities in order. Accolades come and go. Accomplishments are fleeting. But that which will last is what I hope you will be about, Michelle. And that's loving well. Being responsible to family and friends, caring about people even before you know their name. And everything else will come. You know, we just came out of the Olympics. And perhaps one of the most talked about stories continues to permeate in my spirit. And I think about Abby and Nikki. You all remember Abby and Nikki who showed up at the Olympics. Now, you know, you don't just show up at the Olympics. You go to the Olympics to get the medal, to get the goal, and to go back home. Did it. 
But something happened along the way. After years and years of preparation, after practices and sacrifices, something happened. And they both found themselves in a very dark, isolated place. But if you read the commentaries and if you've listened to the interviews, you recognize in that place in space where it seemed as though all was lost, they practiced what it meant to trust God, to love your neighbor as yourself. And they stopped and they cared for one another. The metal was no longer an issue, but how they loved one another, how they cared for one another was what became most important to them. What would our lives look like if we earnestly and consistently sought to care for the other, putting our own needs aside, trusting that God will provide for us far beyond what we could hope for or imagine. That's what God was sharing with the disciples. I'm not asking for you to provide food for 5,000 people. I'm God, I know you can't do that. I know that you can't heal people in the way that I can heal people, but I'm asking, are you willing to sit with them? Are you willing to listen to their story? Are you willing to value them as those who have been created in my image? What are you willing to do? And why is that important? It's important because the ultimate lesson that Jesus wanted for the disciples to understand, and he wanted those 5,000 people to understand, was that what's most important, the meal certainly is important. The meal is important. My sitting down to listen to your story is important. But what is most important is that you come into a relationship that Jesus Christ is Lord and that no one can do for you what Christ alone can do. And if we understand that, that when we encounter the other, that what God is saying to us is you are merely a vessel. I am using you so that they may encounter the greater gift. And that is a relationship with me because only I can feed them in a way that lasts for all eternity. You all, over the next several weeks, we're going to continue to engage the text. And we're going to continue to discover what it means to be a good neighbor. What I would tell you is perhaps what you already know. And that is, God is calling you. You have something of value to offer. Make no mistake, don't think that you have to go out and fix the community. You can't solve the problems that your neighbors are experiencing, but you can be available to offer your heart, to embody what it means to be the light of Jesus Christ. To go in and to begin to proselytize is not what we're asking. And in fact, 
it is frowned upon. There's a saying that says that people want to know how much you care before they want to know how much you know. Lend your heart. Lend your hands. Be the light of Christ. Avail yourselves. And Christ will do the rest. Trust God that you too might be found faithful. Are you willing? Amen. Are you willing? I heard Dan, that's all that I heard. Are you willing to be found faithful? Yes. Yes. Amen. I will sit down. Thanks be to God.